If you like building electric guitars, you should stick around. We're well into the building of a guitar inspired by Jimmy Page's Dragon Telecaster. I'm going through the build step by step using the simplest tools and techniques so you can follow along and build one yourself. So stay with me, let's build a guitar. Yoav and this is the electric luthier. Today we'll continue the build of a Tele style guitar we started in the first two parts of this series. We've already got our body made, routed and with the dragon on it. The laminated neck is already with a truss rod and glued to a slotted fretboard. Today we'll do all the dot inlays on the fretboard and get busy fretting. So let's pick up where we left off. While the back of the neck is still flat, I'll prepare the tools for laying the front and side dots as well as radiusing the fretboard. I have my neck clamped down. I have my neck template just for reference. The 9.5 radius sanding block is also there. A longer one or the fancy aluminum ones would be even better. I will also need a ruler, masking tape, super glue, sanding paper, my white dots, a matching drill, a radius gauge, and a leveling beam. I'll start by marking the center spot between every two frets that require a dot. I simply measure two diagonal lines between the frets and mark the crossing point. For the 12 fret dots, I divide the width in two and find two centers in the same way. I use my template to avoid any silly positioning mistakes. I also punch mark the dots and double check that I have the drill that matches the dots diameter. A sharp wood drill bit is preferred. You want to drill deep enough so the dots will pretty much align with the fretboard and will be totally flush after sanding. When sanding for the radius, the least amount will be sanded from the center line. So if the dots are slightly too high, we're still okay. The side dots of the fretboard will get sanded much more because of the relatively round 9.5 inch radius. The double dots at the 12th fret or if you ever have 24 frets, will need to be low enough not to get sanded away. This is more of a problem if you're using thin inlays such as uh, Mother of Pearl. The dots I have are about two millimeters thick, which is just over one eighth of an inch, so I have plenty of room for error. Use a depth stop or just eyeball it and make adjustments as you go along. I put a drop of super glue and hammer in the dots with my toy fret hammer. More about that later. Do use protective goggles when there's a chance of super glue spraying, like when I hammer on it. Make sure to use a hammer which will not damage the wood around the dots. This does not require much force anyway. I don't even bother wiping away the glue it will be sanded away in just a little bit. I'm not going to be putting the side dots yet. I want to first sand the radius of the fretboard and have the final thickness of the side first. Indian rosewood is a hardwood and I'll start with a low grit paper like 60 or 80 to get the majority of the material off. I attach it to the block with masking tape and super glue. Since I have a short block, I pay extra attention to keeping it parallel to the neck and using long, smooth strokes. You really don't need to apply too much force here. The protruding white dots will get sanded away quickly. Remember, it's the sides which need the most sanding, so when I see the super glue stains starting to fade away, I know I'm also touching the center, and that means I'm getting close. 
My fretboard is thick, so I'm not worried about removing too much of it. I am more concerned with sanding evenly along the length of the board and not creating any valleys by too much localized sanding. I will periodically check with my radius gauge to determine my progress. It's best to look at a low angle with backlight. If I was aiming for the vintage 7.25 inch, you can see by the space showing in the center that I would have more sanding to do at the side. However, if 12 inch was my preferred radius, the rocking of the radius gauge and the spaces on the sides show me that I would need to flatten my fretboard and supposedly have sanded too much. With a 9.5 inch gauge, however, I can see that I'm pretty much done and there are no spaces. I will give a few more strokes and switch to higher grits to finish it. The higher grits are not meant to shape it, but just remove the scratches of the lower grits and smooth it. Now that the fretboard is shaped, I can put the side dots in place. I'm using these designated 2mm plastic thingies. I just measure and mark the center point between the corresponding frets. Again, with a spring marker. If there's a name for this tool, please let me know in the comments below. It just makes avoiding slipping with the drill much easier. I'll drill a few millimeters deep. It doesn't really matter how much. I try to avoid making a super glue mess at this point and if I put a drop into the hole they will surely flow over. So I make a little puddle of super glue on a piece of masking tape and just wet the tip before I insert it. I tried a few methods of cutting it, a razor blade, a scalpel knife. Turns out it's easiest for me to leave it a bit while cutting it with scissors and after the glue has dried, trim it flush with a sharp chisel. After that, it's just some light sanding with a block or leveling beam. You know that I'll personally really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell beside it. And do come check my website, theelectricluthier.com with plenty of articles on guitar building and more related stuff. Drilling a hole for the truss rod axis is simply what it sounds like. You have to estimate the area you want to get and mark it. I always prefer drilling a small pilot hole to guide the bigger one to follow. You have to start at a high angle and only after you're deep enough for the drill not to slip, lower down to an angle closer to the neck. Make sure to very slowly push in until you barely touch the truss rod or just reach the hollow area you've routed in the neck before. Close contact between the drill and the truss rod is not helpful to either of them. Once I'm there, I'll take the truss rod hex key, 5 millimeters in this case, and check that I can reach the truss rod and actually adjust it. Once I verify that, I can widen the hole for a more comfortable diameter. With shorter drills, I like to put a piece of masking tape on the headstock so I don't scrape it with a drill chuck. Then it's some light sanding for the hole and I'm done. There are all types of covers and embellishments people do to these holes. I'm just going to leave it like that. Let's call it vintage. Before fretting, we have our last chance to comfortably sand the fretboard. I found that the side of my neck is not as straight and smooth as I would want it to be. You don't want to find out that you have little dents or wobbles on the side of the neck when you string it and have the strings as reference. The leveling beam is an excellent tool for light sanding of the neck and great for these little bumps. This is also a good chance to comfortably give the top part its final sanding. Our neck and fretboard are now ready for slotting. 
The first step is to clean the slots and verify they are deep enough with their new radius. I do that with my slotting saw. I mark the desired depth with masking tape and gently go slot by slot and th run through it. You can see from the amount of dust I'm making that there's not too much sawing going on. It's mostly cleaning up. The next stage is not a must but may be beneficial sooner than you expect. I go through all the slots and lightly bevel their edges with a small triangular file. This will help in a number of ways. The first is just the ease of inserting the frets minutes from now. And the second is taking them out without damaging chipping the fretboard. You may say that the refretting may be years away and who knows who will do it? Well first, I'd like to extend the courtesy to whoever may be the one doing the refretting. But second, it may be an hour from now when I make a mistake or find out that I managed to have too shallow a slot after all and I have to take out a fret after I've hammered the heck out of it. Then comes glue. There are a few approaches to using glue when fretting. Most luthiers would agree that it's not the glue that holds the fret in place. It's the fret's tang's barb. There are little thorns slightly wider than the tang itself which will lodge into the side of the slot and prevent it from slipping out. The glue may reinforce that but will also serve as a filler for the space left around the tang or under it and it will help with sustain, wood flexibility and aesthetics. Some luthiers avoid it altogether. Then there are also views on which glue to use and how to apply it. One of the methods involves dripping low viscosity super glue from the sides of the fretboard after fretting and others apply it in advance. Whenever possible I lean towards carpenter's glue. It's easier to work with, to clean, it's cheaper and it's more forgiving. If you super glued a mistake and it hardened, you wished you hadn't. I will apply the glue to a few slots at a time push it in a little and wipe the excess with a damp cloth. You can cut the frets ahead of time, a few at a time or just one at a time. You can actually buy pre-cut frets as well. Naturally buying in rolls is cheaper in the long run but not if you're gonna be building one or two guitars. Not everyone has a good fret press and hammering is still the most common way of fretting definitely by non-professionals or non-commercial guitar builders. I've started hammering the frets in with this cheap fretting hammer you can find on Amazon and other online stores. It gets the frets in alright but it doesn't have enough weight to really nudge it all the way through like I would want it to. The frets have a very tight fit, which is a good thing, but they do require some force to get into place properly. I guess it may be okay if you are using a press for the final bit, but by itself it just doesn't work for me and you'll see the consequences in a bit. Meanwhile I've switched back to my trusty carpenter's hammer, which definitely has more oomph. The downside of this hammer and the reason you should get a proper fretting hammer if you plan on hammering frets is the material. The simple logic is that the weaker material will be the one to get damaged and you don't want that to be the frets. Fretting hammers, my toy hammer included, have brass or plastic tips which will take the beating instead of the frets. Since I'm still using carpenter's hammer 
I try to find the balance between the force and the number of hits I need for good even fretting. We'll know how it did when leveling. After a few frets, you sort of get into the groove, so to speak, and just hammer away. I didn't mention pre-bending the frets so far, as this roll came at something very close to 7.5 inch radius. It's a roll after all. That is just perfect for a 9.5 radius fretboard. We always want the frets to be slightly overbent. This way, the edges are the ones to be inserted first and the middle hammered in last. This should prevent the edges tendency to splay and lift when hammering the center first or if they were straight to begin with. This is more common with thinner and softer frets, but it makes the process a bit easier. Another tool you need is a decent fret cutter. Frets and jumbo frets in particular are pretty strong. I'm not even talking about stainless steel frets. Other than the cutting itself, you also want to be able to cut the frets as close as you can to the fretboard to minimize the amount of filing you'll have to do later. Fret cutters have the cutting edge very very close or even flush with the tip of the cutters. I took this brand new flat cutter and filed it to get the same effect. I'm pretty happy with the result, but it could be even tighter and cleaner and I may file it even a bit more to get it totally flush. Always cut frets from the sides so you don't bend the tang and twist the shape of the crown. When all the frets are in and all the tips are cut as close as you can, it's time to file those tips. You can use a fret leveling beam or any flat file but a designated fret tip file will make getting a consistent and even angle much easier. They come in either wood or plastic with an embedded file at about 35 degrees. I play a little with the angle while filing to get the file up to 90 degrees to file up those sides of the fretboards. When you start filing, it will feel very jagged and rough and will get slightly smoother the more you file. You will feel a slight change in texture when you start touching the wood. And this is also when you want to stop. The fret tips are still going to be a bit sharp to the touch, but they should be at an even angle and filed to the edge of the fretboard. We will now file the fret tips. Going in with a small file and manually rounding and smoothing is one of the most time consuming parts of fretting. There are two types of files commonly used for this job. It's either a flat file or a triangular one. In both cases you want to make sure that the blade or the edge of the file itself is filed off and smooth is this is the part which will be running against the wood. You may want to mask the fretboard at this point already we'll be doing it later anyway. This will be one of the parts which will determine a great deal of how the neck feels when playing. This is where custom necks are different for mass-produced guitars. The rounding is done in two dimensions. From the top view, we're aiming to remove the now flat edge to a totally round edge at the edge of the fretboard. From the side aspect, we want to smooth those 35 degrees we created with the file. Try not to file the top of the crown too much, just the edge towards the fretboard. This may become tedious or repetitive and even boring. Hang in there and plow on, it'll be worth it. When done, I also like to wrap a piece of 600 grit sandpaper over my fingers and lightly go over those tips to remove some of the scratches the files have made. 
Our neck is now fretted and ready for the final steps to make it a joy to play. Join me in the next part when we will finish leveling, recrowning and polishing the frets. After that, we'll start clear coating. Until then, if you want more information about building electric guitars, articles and more, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell button to get notified, check out the links below and come visit us at theelectricluthier.com.